Welcome back. So, uh, Professor uh, Pate, you were talking about uh, personnel just before we went on that break. E yes. I think we have uh, a large pool of health workforce in Nigeria that is well trained, both in Nigeria at the moment and also in the diaspora. There are Nigerians all over the world, but also here we have good human resources that have been trained. There are gaps in terms of distribution of that health workforce. Many are in the private sector and many are only in the urban areas, not the rural areas. In terms of the quality of the training is variable. And I think there are some universities that have been able to train really world-class health uh, workers, both the physicians, pharmacists, but also other medical uh, health professionals that are contributing. But we need to incentivize those that are here to deploy their services, to retain them, to accommodate them and incentivize them to stay in the rural areas and deliver the services that are needed in those areas. We have a lot of exodus of young health workers because the system, in a way, has not been able to accommodate their aspirations or provide them the enablement to deliver the best that they can. So while uh, we have the endowment of the human resources, we have not been as resourceful in retaining that workforce and deploying them effectively to advance the health care of our people. Okay, let's talk about um, the Big Win Foundation. What's what the, the, the crux? The idea behind uh, the work that we currently do with Big Green Philanthropy is really around human capital on the African continent. The youthful population of this continent is its greatest asset, not only here in Nigeria, but all over the continent. And for the demographic dividend to be harnessed, governments, national leaders have to invest in that youthful population, have to invest in their health, basic health to maintain their cognitive abilities, nutrition, they have to invest in education, they have to invest in creating employment opportunities for youth. So we work in several countries on the continent. Ethiopia, for example, is one country where we've spent quite a bit of time helping deal with stunting problem, which Ethiopia is trying to get to zero over the next several years. That's a commitment that the national government made because they realized that stunting detracts from the cognitive abilities of their children and they want to eliminate it. And we're supporting them to be able to do that in two regions and then expand that. Then the new leadership of that country asked us to help their aspiration to create one million jobs for their youth. Not just any job, not jobs as, let's say, recharge card sellers or touts or political thugs or some other, no, but really quality jobs that are sustainable, that are high paying, that they can progress. So we are working with that government as well as other partners on the continent to do that. In Liberia, we've done a lot on education, trying to improve the fiscal space for education during the previous administration of Salim Johnson, but also with the new administration that has come into play in Liberia. Same thing in Mozambique. We're also working with the African Development Bank and Angote Foundation in terms of repositioning nutrition on the African continent because 43% of children in this continent that are under five are stunted. And if we really want to claim the future and be competitive, we cannot have stunted children. Coming back to this country, for instance, there are parts of our country that more than 50% of the children are stunted, are stunted. And stunting reduces the intellectual abilities of children. It detracts from the pool of human capital that the country has and children that are stunted are not able to do well in school. Their incomes over their lifetimes is less, mm. and they are not able to contribute into the growth. This country can be great, but we have to invest in the children and youth and enable them to have the competence, the skills, the uh, employment opportunity, or the opportunities to create jobs for themselves and others, mm. for this country to grow and claim what is definitely in its future promise. Mm -hmm. Now, what should mothers be doing to prevent stunting that you just spoke about? So, the, 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 the breastfeeding is one thing. That's a key bit of it. And I think uh, there's been a lot of effort, and there is currently a lot of effort by both uh, the current leadership of the health sector, but also other political leaders to drive 
uh, breastfeeding in this country. But beyond that, growth monitoring of children, feeding practices of those children, of those infants, weeding practices, ensuring diversity of the meals that kids get, not just uh, carbohydrates, but they have lipids and protein. Uh, that's very important at the right stage in life, before the age of three. The first 1,000 days is key. Other elements of sanitation, hygiene, so water, and hygiene are important because diarrheal diseases, when they repeat themselves, detract from the child's nutritional um, uh, nutrition. Because not only macro, the food and the energy, but also the micronutrients that they lose from repeated diarrhea. And water and sanitation is key. Immunization, immunization against preventable diseases. So measles, for instance. When you see children having measles because they have been unimmunized, it affects their nutrition because they can't eat. When they have pneumonia, they cannot eat. They vomit, they have diarrhea, and that affects their nutrition. And it takes away from the development of their brains because the brain of a malnourished child is very different. What Akin Adesina says, the gray matter infrastructure of a stunted child is much more different. And there are really, um, let's say, very stark images that I can share with you at some other point to show that the brain, the neurons, of the brain of a stunted child is actually damaged and that affects their intellect. So there are things that mothers can do, fathers can do, communities and households can do, health workers can do, but wider government also needs to do. So in Ethiopia, we are deploying a multi-sectoral set of actions within two regions to really get it leapfrog because the government of the day has promised that it wants to get to eliminate stunting by 2025 in that country. And so with that leadership, we are supporting them to be able to do that. So how much support are you bringing to Nigeria, you know, in terms of, because this figures, 40 to 50 percent of children stunted in, in some parts of Nigeria, it's, it's very alarming. How, I know that in some of the primary health centers, you have, have information, you know, given out to mothers and people trying to see what they can do about it. We have the Saving One Million Lives uh, Initiative.